Welcome to Hearthstone Deck Tech Season 2, Episode 5, Control Warlock with Coach Nick. Hi today, everyone. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 5 of Hearthstone Deck Tech Podcast. I'm your host, Ken, and today I have a very special guest. Um... I know for a lot of people who listen to the podcast, uh, reaching legend is one of the, the bigger questions and kind of obstacles that face a lot of players. And for me, um, I couldn't do it on my own. I really, like the first time I ever hit legend, uh, I didn't know if I could hit it, you know? And I, I really needed an outside perspective to explain to me when I was doing things incorrectly or what lines of play I was missing. And um, today's guest is really special to me because it, he is the first coach to help me get to legend. And uh, it's none other than my friend from Turkey, the ever wonderful, ever good looking Nick, Coach Nick. So Nick, welcome to the show. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if I deserve all the compliments, but <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, you know, it's so funny, Nick, you are what, what are you like 22 years old? 21 now. 21, 21. 21 years old. So when, when, when did Patron Warrior, when was Patron Warrior out? That was maybe two years ago, right? You think? Two, two or three. I think it was three years ago. So two or three years ago, I was 34 or 33 years old. And then there was this 19, 18-year-old kid who was teaching me how to be better at Hearthstone. And that was you. And uh, I know we, we <laughs> did like, it was so funny because, you know, you live in, in Turkey and, you know, we spent tons of time together uh, playing Hearthstone and just going through lines of play, coaching me. Um, and, you know, with, with, in my opinion, was just like one of the best decks ever created in Patreon Warrior. And we had a great definitely, run. Definitely, definitely. We had a great run. Like, and it was so enjoyable um, as an experience. It was amazing. And, you know, I'm an older guy. I'm old, man. I'm, thir- I'm twice your age. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I definitely learned so much. And definitely from that experience, I became a much, much better player. And I could see how quick my growth in the game changed after that experience, you know. And, you know, because of the experience with you, Nick, um, you know, I was very willing to get coaching from, like, other players in the future, like Sippy Wee and Meaty. Uh, You know, I paid top dollar for those. But, uh, you know, like, uh, it was definitely worth it. but enough about that. Let's talk a little bit about you, Nick. Why don't you tell the viewers at home about your Hearthstone experience, how you got into the game, and maybe other card game experience you have that helped you, uh, you know, improve in Hearthstone. Uh, so I started the game around like when the Pyroblast nerf happened. Uh, I saw it from a YouTuber, if I recall correctly, and I just downloaded the game. Uh, it felt super fun at first, uh, since I really enjoyed Yu-Gi-Oh! as a kid, uh, mm-hmm. watching the cartoon. And uh, having to, uh, uh, having the ability to play a game like that really uh, caught me. So uh, that's what, when I first started the game. got a bit more serious in the following years, since I was just learning the game. I didn't know you could actually like be a pro or whatever, or have uh, to play the game really well. Uh, and I, it wasn't, it was definitely no, never like that. Then at some point I felt like uh, the game was actually fun and I could, if I invested a little bit more time into it, I could be one of the you know, no, decent enough players to play it. Uh, so then uh, it was basically about um, uh, grinding the game and getting, getting to know. Uh, more about the deck list, more about the specific matchups, and the game is really fun in my opinion. Even though you know all of the arguments about RNG and whatnot, I, I definitely enjoy the game. I still do, and that's one of the great things about Hearthstone, in my opinion. That's actually fun. What um, you know? I know you're in college now. Uh, you were in high school when you were coaching me. Gosh, this is so crazy, right? Yeah. Like, yep. He was in high school. He was like doing exams and then like coaching me on the side. You know, like. You're in high school and you're in college now, so I, I know you've maybe taken a, a short break from Hearthstone, but you've recently got back into it because I see you climbing the ladder often. So, yeah, I just uh, I had a bit of a busy uh, few months, and uh, so I, since my finals are over now, I started to play a bit more. Uh, 
it was uh, the meta game definitely shifted a lot and uh like compared to past i have a lot more free time and the, i guess the, in general freedom because my mom absolutely hated me playing hearthstone so mm. much <laughs> in high school <laughs> uh she, she wanted to be she wanted me to be more serious with my studies but this game was really like fun for me and i, yeah. I definitely spent uh, three four hours every night uh, playing and spending some time um mm. So right now I wanna you know maybe play a bit more not so seriously probably but I wanna have fun uh, maybe climb ladder uh, a bit more uh, seriously. So um, you know now that you've been playing a little you know you're introduced to all these new cards. Uh, what type of archetypes uh, stand out to you as pretty powerful or like what are what are some decks that you're like wow this is a this is something new and unique to the game that I haven't seen in the past couple years. I think the new Hunter package with the Zulchin and whatnot seems really uh, powerful to me. It has a really good uh, early game, a decent early game with, uh, I guess, even have the super late game, it even has that with the um, 4 mana plus 3 plus 3 card. I can't remember its name though. Uh, so this archetype has the like ability to beat Control Warrior even, as a val in, the, even, in, the, even in the value game and uh, definitely has the upper edge on the mage matchup in my opinion with the deadly shot and uh, yeah. ha having the ability to have an early pressure so i really like the archetype as a whole yeah and man you know honestly it's so what are you oh, actually you know what it was funny because uh, the other day i was spectating one of your matches and you were playing conjurer's mage right or like a version of conjurer's mage right, and right. then you were up against uh that uh, that spell hunter and then you know he just happened to have the craziest zoljin turn that was ridiculous you know, you got the twin spell card, the one that makes the five-five rush guy, and I'm just like, man, what? This is madness. He cleared out that conjurer's <laughs> board so wild, or like so easily, which was pretty, pretty nuts. I can I can definitely see how that could be one of Mage's uh, rougher matchups. Um, what what is one of your proudest accomplishments or moments in Hearthstone, whether it be uh, a ladder finish or? you know, developing a certain type of archetype or coaching somebody, whatever it may be. What was your proudest, proudest moment, uh, I think? Proudest moment? I, I, more than ladder, what I enjoy is playing in the Open Cups. Mm. And winning my first Open Cup was, I think, my proudest moment. Uh, it was a Zotac Cup, if I remember correctly, with around like 100 people. Mm -hmm. How many uh, hours was that? I, I can't remember. Like I started in the morning, uh, and it's right before lunch, so <laughs> that's oh. what I remember. So it was probably four to five hours. Wow! And I, I was playing this mage list that I created on my own. It was after CVG, I think, mm -hmm. uh, with the Echo of Medivh, the four mana card yeah. that gives you a copy of the minions. Mm -hmm. I played Molten Giant, so not I had this perfect list and mm -hmm. uh, playing, winning the tournament with with my own original list that no one else was playing. That was, I think, my proudest moment. That's awesome. Man. Have you have you you haven't entered any of the recent cups now that specialist format is out and the changes to no. competitor Hearthstone? Yeah, well, I mean, I I assume that you don't have thirteen hours of your day to spare to play one cup. You know, that's that's is, pretty is much what the experience. Right is. Yeah, you're, you're looking like twelve rounds of Hearthstone, and you know, waiting around for an hour or whatever to play your next round. And only the winner goes. You know I mean, what I mean? You have to win the cup. Like, you have to go 11-0 or whatever it is, 12-1, whatever to to advance. It's ridiculous. I mean, it sounds like an awful format for the it, players. Like, if if you if we, uh, you know, losing in the first round should be as painful, if not more painful, than losing in the last round. You know, after you spent 10 hours of your day and you just lose in the last game. Correct. That's uh, exact. That's my 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 thoughts exactly. I was telling Meaty this uh, when he was on a podcast a few weeks back, and we we agreed like it's just you know it's not worth that time commitment because even if you win, you know, that's not even a guarantee that you make it to the the to Las Vegas or wherever the next open qualifier mm -hmm. is. Right. That's it's so crazy. I do like specialists though. I think specialists is interesting as a format. Um, yeah. Although I personally haven't played in a lot of any of that format yet. So, but. Um, what was I going to ask you? Uh, you know, now that we're talking about the Grandmaster thing in general, uh, were there any players that you, I don't know, idolize or look up to that you were surprised didn't make it into the Grandmasters? Uh, one of the players that I like watching the most is Asmodai. 
he is a streamer from Sweet Norway, not Sweden. He's a streamer from Norway, mm -hmm. and uh, he, I think he's one of the best players that does not compete in the uh, tournaments. He just like he, uh, he definitely has the ability to, but he just refuses to be a part of it, mm -hmm. uh, since like he, he says that it takes up a lot of time and effort, and it's just not worth it in his in his opinion. And I, I, I would have definitely loved to see him there. He plays at a really high level of Hearthstone, and it's as a streamer, he's also quite fun to to uh, watch him. Yeah, he's pretty uh, creative I would have too. Loved to watch. He has a long hair, right? He's got like long, kind of brownish yeah, yeah, blonde. Yeah, always wears like wears a cap. Yeah, he's good. He's really good. Like, I, and I, I've seen him finish like one uh, rank one many times. He's good. He's super good. I'm actually surprised he he doesn't have a he wasn't invited either. Um, yeah, he just he 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 used to compete. I think like a year or two ago, he had yeah, he played in a couple of tournaments. Yeah, just and then he just stopped, I guess, and like gradually just played less and less and doesn't play at all in right now in tournament. Play. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm guessing that you know uh, his following on Twitch, it like is a better return on investment than you know yeah, putting in time definitely. into a tournament. Like you know, it's just he already makes good content. You know, he's he is a very fun guy to watch. So. And he's very good, a very strong player. Um, what are three basic principles that players looking to improve uh, should focus on in Hearthstone? Like, what are some three core concepts that any good Hearthstone player should know? I think the best advice I can give to someone who wants to get top legend uh, and as a finish it should be to play, you know, without any worries. Don't have like other things in your mind because if you wake, make one mistake that costs you a game every single time you sit to play like a day you make one mistake that costs you the game just because you're tired or whatever you have something mm -hmm. in your mind over the month it adds up to 30 games and i think it's the difference between like having a top 2000 finish and a top 200 finish you know yeah. if you just focus a bit more every single game like if you don't make that one mistake that you just see right after you drop you know you miss lethal by one damage or it's just your combo doesn't work because it's you know, one mana off or whatever that mistake may be. Uh, I think it adds up really quickly in the long run. That's true. That's true. Uh, one of the, one of the other things is like playing a deck list that you're actually familiar with the matchups. I think one of the best examples of this in the Hearthstone you know, history is the Freeze Mage versus Patron Warrior matchup. If you go with, if you as a as a patron warrior, if you go for the damage plan, if you like want, want to kill your opponent as quickly as possible with four things, you more often than not lost the game. But if you went for the armor plan, you know, play your uh, rolling effects with the armor smiths and go up to 30, 40 armor, and mm -hmm. don't don't draw as much as you know possible. Uh, so that would give you like over 80 percent win rates. Yeah. So no. Yeah. Knowing That's your matchups is really important. Do you, is there any other? Do you have any other tip or concept that people should know? Um, what I mean, one of the other things is that like don't switch up deck lists so much. I think this is pretty common advice from everybody because like if you, as I've said, don't your don't know your matchups as well. Uh, if you just like let's play mage today a bit tomorrow, you know, bits bit of control warriors, a bit of token druid. Mm -hmm. I mean, since you don't know the deck list so well, what to tech versus certain meta uh, when you oppose certain meta picks a lot more often than not the the others. So, uh, if you don't know these ins and outs of your deck, then your win rate will drop significantly. So, having a deck that you like, a good deck that you like, is a is a very important thing in climbing, in my opinion. So, I, on that note, do you recommend like one deck only, or would you? play two like different type of archetypes like an aggressive deck and then maybe like a combo deck or like a control deck if you're queuing into consistent anti-aggro matchups that, or just one deck and just flat out try to learn that deck as best you can even it's bad matchups uh, I guess I guess like having more options is always a good thing, right? If you know how to play them at at least a basic level, you know how to, how I play, like who's the beat town sort of level. If mm -hmm. you know like what to do in general, having a counter matchup for other uh, other archetypes is always a good thing. But if you know like if you're pretty if you're pretty new to the game, 
having a you know a bit of an easier deck to master is always uh, always one of the things that you should uh, do in any game I guess like uh, having the basics down with a easy deck easier deck that you know by heart is always mm -hmm. the good uh, approach to climbing so so I know um I know that you've brought a special deck list for us and I know it's special because I definitely don't see anybody playing this archetype right now uh, but before we get into that deck in particular I wanted to know your thoughts on deck building in general like how do you go about with the deck building process do you decide on a meta that you want to focus and exploit or do you just decide on a card or a concept that you really like and try to tweak it uh, what do you do how do you start off with building a deck from scratch uh, one of the biggest struggles that I had when I started playing Hearthstone was that I, I didn't have many cards. Uh, since I was in high school, didn't have the money to you know buy packs, or I didn't just have a, I didn't I didn't have a full collection. So I, I, I had to you know do what what I had in, uh, in my hand, and uh, this I think taught me a lot about deck building in general. You know what you with whatever you have in your hand, you try to make a decent deck and try to climb with that and you don't have all the meta options. So right now when new cards hit, you can see the, I can see the um, synergies a bit better, I guess. So what I do when I start building a deck is, uh, first I am I look at the meta in general, you know, is it the aggro meta or is it a control meta? Like right now it's just, control decks are much more powerful than, uh, you know, the past mm -hmm. aggro decks. Yeah. So the second thing I think is how do I beat it in general? Is it like uh, everything has a decent counter? So. Uh, when you have a general plan in mind, uh, then you can approach that uh, thing. Or if it's in tournament play, what type of deck I'm trying to uh, target and then play, and then build the deck around that. Or some of the times you just absolutely love an archetype and you just want to follow that and make it as powerful as possible, then that, that's something I also do as well, which is what uh, my today's deck is about. Okay. So, like, moving into today's to into today's deck, you've brought a uh, hand lock. And uh, you, you sent a couple of lists here. Um, and But this is something that you think is very viable for both the ladder and for like tournament play, for specialist play? I mean, specialist, I don't think so. Uh, because this deck has very significant weaknesses, especially versus a bit more aggro matchups, versus aggro matchups. Uh, and since this deck isn't deck, the the basic principle behind it is play giants and drakes and the major archetype does this and it's very popular many people try to tech versus the mage so you kind of you know fall to the get same targeted. Kind of, yeah. yeah yeah it's not the most powerful because mage is more powerful it's mage is so popular i think mm -hmm. it would have been more viable if mage wasn't played as much so like warriors don't play bgh and people don't generally tech against uh, giants. So I don't think it's very viable in the competitive play. I mean, I guess in the conquest format, it would be a lot better to target control warrior with this and uh, mage and hunter, the Zul'jin hunter, because I think the hunter list absolutely crushes control warrior hmm. or boom warrior for that matter. Uh, like it's it's better, at least has like 70% rate. And this deck would be better in that, but since we don't play that format anymore, I don't think it's very viable in the tournament play. Okay. So for those of you at home, if you're watching this video on YouTube or if you're listening to the podcast and you just want to grab the deck code, that deck code will be in the description. Um, but for those of you who aren't going to grab the deck code, I'm just going to read off the, the, the standard list. There's a couple lists here. Um, the standard list has two Mortal Coils, one Acidic Swamp Ooze, two Doomsayers, one Plot Twist, two Sun Fury Protectors, one Earth and Ring Farseer, two Shadow Bolts, two Hellfires, one Shadow Flame, one Spellbreaker, two Twilight Drakes, two Rotten Apple Bombs, one Ziliax, two uh, Aranasi Broodmother, uh, two Siphon Souls, one Lord Godfrey, uh, two Twisting Nethers, one Lord Jaraxxus, and two Mountain Giants. And, you know, looking at this, uh, just right off the bat, there are, like, three huge things that stick out to me which i really really love already like number one it's just it's handlock right you got the mountain uh, mountain giant synergy um and you have twilight drakes but then you also have lord jaraxxus which is a legendary warlock card that 
you know, I, I really haven't seen a lot of Lloyd Jaraxxus in a long, long time, ever since Go Goldon has kind of come out, yeah. right? So it's really nice to see that. And I love the amount of healing in the deck, like the double apple bomb, the Zilliax, the brood mother. I mean, that's, that is what I'm talking about, man. I like it. <laughs> can, you, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what, what you want to target with this deck and what you don't want to see? So this deck had uh, like the, when I first started building this deck, uh, I thought like I, I really enjoy playing the Giant's Mage list, but Giant Mage list has absolutely no removal for the early game uh, decks. So when a hunter, when you face a hunter, it usually destroys you because by by you reach turn time, by the time you reach turn four, uh, you usually de you're, you're usually dead. So what I wanted to do was like build a deck list with more uh, board removal and more healing. That so I would be better worse the early game archetypes. But this deck I think has the advantage of having a better win percentage than mage versus uh, agro agro decks, mm -hmm. which is which I think like uh, versus shaman it's really favored. Shaman very rarely wins versus this deck. How about versus a control warrior? Like I, I know you were saying that mage or control warrior kind of tired. Well, no, doesn't mage beat control warrior? It does, definitely mm -hmm. does. Um, it does uh, very uh, decisively, I would say. Like, the warrior has very few chances to actually come back if they don't have that uh, early game, like, 2 3 4 combo with the, uh, like, getting you down to 10 health and bombing you down, usually. Yeah. That's the only way they win, from what I've seen. This deck also beats warrior, especially if you tech in a bit more warrior specific cards, if you see a lot of that. Which is one of the like I I use I don't like uh, Watson apple bombs versus warrior. Uh, the faceless manipulators are much better in that matchup, so I tend to play that way in the warrior matchup. What what do you copy with the manipulators, the faceless manipulators in that matchup? I mean, it's always a good idea to get a giant on four and then faceless on five, which is usually unbeatable versus warrior. They they don't have that fast of an answer to that if uh, if they don't get the shield slams. That's that's a win condition on its own, mm. and the other than that, usually Jaraxxus wins the game on, on itself versus Warrior. So when you get a bit low, it's always it's always a good idea to uh, faceless your opponent's Zilliax minion, whatever he merges uh, magnetic magnetics mm. into with the Zilliax. If you copy that, you get a lot of heal. And Jaraxxus' six six are usually unbeatable versus Warrior if you have that. I noticed that there's a augmented Elec in that Control Warrior focus list. Um, is that just for the Elysiana, or what, what do you use the Elec with? Oh, it's Elec's. Uh, Elec is usually comboed with Plot Twist. When you uh, shuffle mm -hmm. your hand into your deck, it shuffles another one, so you get a thicker deck list. Ah. Uh, deck. So it's great versus for your for cheap, uh, cheap price. So that, and, okay. No, uh, sorry, I don't want to interrupt, but uh, plot twist is a card that I love because you know it just reminds me a lot of uh, magic the gathering and like uh, brainstorm yeah. or, or typical uh, uh, hand manipulation effects right but this is such a difficult card to use so like can you give maybe the listeners at home some advice on when or where like what situations to look around when you decide to play a plot twist So plot twist, uh, plot twist's main usage is, I think, not for the elect combo to get a bigger deck list, but it also has the ability to, uh, you know, refresh your hand where you don't get your giants or drakes on maybe turn four, five, turn five or six. It, mm -hmm. it definitely helps with that uh, to get a fresh hand with more threats, especially versus mage. It's quite powerful in the mage matchup because once you run out of threats, they just, you know, play something and another, another and. At some point, your removals are over, and they just swamp the board and win. So this is quite this is quite effective versus mage to re re uh, refresh your hand. Uh, it also helps with healing uh, with our nasty brother. And when you get like when you draw them, you just don't want to play them for six mana. And when you like refresh and get get them once more, draw them once more, it's just four more heal. <laughs> if you're in a desperate situation, it also helps with that. And I guess in general versus aggro for two mana finding like uh, after you run out of removals in your hand just getting a, f a fresh set of removals usually means that you win the matchup because 
uh, they just don't have that much um, Fuel. juice in the back. I see, I see. Uh, what are what are some typical flex choices here? Like, what do you think are the 30th and the 29th card in the deck? Was it the Rotten Apple Bombs? Are those the first cards to cut, definitely, I guess? Definitely. I, I just definitely like dislike them because when you play them into the board, nothing happens. You, know, you don't you don't know how, if you will have the death rattle effect. They just might silence it and go past it. They they are just, uh, in general, weak cards, but I don't know what to fill them, fill their places in because in the last uh, rotation, Warlock lost a lot. Like, mm -hmm. uh, we lost Defile, we lost uh, four mana card with the healing, real lifesteal, three, five, seven damage. Just can't remember its name. Oh, yeah, we lost, Spellstone. Uh, yeah, Gu yeah. yeah spell MF is Spellstone. We lost Gul'dan. Yeah. A lot like it was lost, so uh, the stack uh, needs something to heal and you know pass the turns five six. Uh, so the rotten apple bombs was the only choice that I I thought of, but uh, it's definitely not a good card in my opinion. Like if so in the next expansion, I definitely want to cut these out and replace them with something that will hopefully help this archetype. Man, I really like uh, Aranasi Broodmother. Like, I think that card is underrated. Like, maybe it doesn't have enough support yet in the Warlock class, but I think that card is on the verge of just being extremely good. Like, I, you know, the heal for four is is always relevant, and with like, you know, like you said, plot twist, and you know, hopefully other mechanics in the future. I think it's going to be a great card. Actually, I'm, I don't know. Definitely, definitely, it's going to be viable, if not one of the good cards of Warlock. Uh, mainly because like you don't have to pay the mana for the healing. Yeah. Strong. That's quite great, in my opinion, as this uh, card goes. Um, what was I going to ask you about? Uh, for Jaraxxus, because I know, you know, Jaraxxus is a old, old control favorite, but I mean, you know, He's like Michael Jordan, you know what I mean? Like, everyone knows about him, but not many people have seen him played. And, you know, he just came out of retirement. He's back in this deck. Like, <laughs> what are some pointers that you can give new players who probably haven't messed around with Jaraxxus uh, enough? Like, when should you play this aggressively? Like, even if you're at 30 life, what matchup should you decide to just go like, well, I need my Jaraxxus out now to make my hero power or... And what matchup should you be very cautious about playing it and playing it very late? I think Jaraxxus is mainly in this deck to have the late game juice going with the 6-6s. Six and versus a warrior, you want to play this card in an early fashion. You know, uh, maybe even like whenever you get 9 mana and it's in your hand, you play it. If the board is allowing you to. Unless your deck is like filled with 10 bombs or whatever. You mm -hmm. want to play this in a warrior matchup fast. Mainly because this card is... Uh, like making you have the threats every single turn because at some point warrior uh, if you don't play Jax in this deck list warrior will win versus you because you don't have the uh, enough you don't have enough threats to actually kill him if they respond to your early giants other than that i think this is a quite good versus uh, you know aggro decks because it has the ability to heal to to 15 and my deck has a lot of healing for the uh, early game i guess and mm -hmm. since we always like hit he, he hits i heal he hits i heal and clear a bit of the board when i get to like really low hp and i played lord jaraxxus it's it happens to be that they also run out of things to hit me with so jaraxxus is right now a good meta call to like get yourself the 15 hp or alexstrasza for that matter they are both really good to like heal versus aggro and that's what i've seen so far playing the stack what are what are some general mulligan strategies like you know, without getting too matchup specific, I guess, like, uh, what, what are you looking to keep in general, I guess, like, versus slow decks or versus aggressive decks? What, what, what should you look to always keep in your hand? I think versus slow decks, it's, um, like, pretty uh, clear to see. You know, you, you need to have the giants to play them early on. You need to have the drakes. And if you're playing uh, faceless, faceless manipulator in the deck, that could be a keep if you also have one of the four or for mana drakes or the giants mm -hmm. uh, also uh, trying to uh, get the jaraxxus in the warrior matchup can be something uh, that you might consider i haven't done it so far but i think it's one of the things that if you play the jaraxxus early on without dying you know in turn 9 10 uh, then 
it, the threat every single turn coming out is very significant to beat the control or your matchup. How and about that, versus you know, the aggressive? Ag yeah, all right, go ahead. Yeah. Ag aggro, uh, you, you want Hellfires. You definitely want Hellfires. You want Doomsayers. I mean, of course, one of them, Hellfires. And versus Shaman, I tend to keep Lord Godfrey in my hand because when they play the um, card with the one man Warnlocks, if you play God, Lord Godfrey, it absolutely clears the board. And usually that's when this deck, or in general, uh, control decks loses versus Shaman. When they play that card that uh, has a death rattle of one one, one Murloc and then play uh, yeah. blood, Bloodlust the following turn. And when you're like 15, 16 HP usually versus Shaman at that point, they just completely kill you, which is which is a shame in my opinion. Like we're playing so good and they just play this card yeah. you cannot deal with immediately and you just yeah. die. Yeah, <laughs> quite frustrating. So this is something I like to keep versus channel. Okay, I see, I see. Um, what are are there any types of decisions with this deck um, that are maybe not very intuitive for a player who's new to the archetype? Like, what type of decisions are are very important decisions to make, but typically difficult to see if you've never piloted the deck before? I think this deck uh, is fairly straightforward to play in the control control matchups if you're like if you play the bits of, of handlock after you play a bit of handlock it's quite easy to play but if and you're playing versus aggro it's a bit difficult to uh you know knowing when to when you have to play your removals or if you can greed out, greed out one more turn sometimes like oh my god i'm gonna get uh, he's gonna absolutely kill me uh, i have to play all these removal to m make him go away right now uh, getting scared versus those type of matchups is usually the biggest mistake I've seen. Mm. Uh, you, you have to greed up because you only have so many, you know, like you have to help uh, in your hand. You typically have one or two removal at any time when you play them out, you know, uh, one, two. And when the third board comes, which it usually does, you lose the game. So like tapping, tapping a bit more and usually saving your removals is uh, one of the key things to play with do versus aggro. Cool. Cool. Um, What was, uh, man, is there anything else you want to add about the deck list in particular? Uh, maybe other tech choices uh, that people could think about if they are facing a, you know, a certain type of meta? Um, I want to say, like, after the buffs, after the buffs hits, I hope, uh, I think the Paladin Aggro archetype would be one of the strong forces because it's will be taunted probably if uh, you know if uh, what i predict is correct it will be taunted it will be mage so uh paladins will get more and more and i think this deck does a really good job versus uh the versus the pa versus the paladin matchup so uh after after the buffs after the buffs hit i think this is a deck to play uh to beat paladin if they are like completely swamping the leather because you don't auto lose any matchup with this deck like like uh, it's always a competitive game, even versus Agro, uh, which is one of the deck's weaker matchups, like versus Hunter, with versus Mech Hunter especially. This deck kind of gets crushed. Uh, I, I don't think I have like over 30% of a win rate because they just have these amazing threats early on, and then uh, with the Poisonous and the 3 mana 2 2 guy, mm, you just get destroyed at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, your giants don't stick, and they have consistent damage with the hero power, so it's it's a bit of a hard matchup. Uh, not and uh, other, I think like when the paladins get stronger, this deck will also become stronger. Uh, at least like when the what what was the six six epic with the secrets guy when that was super popular. Six six epic. Yeah, six six epic card from paladin that brings secrets. Oh, from mysterious deck. challenger. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the one that the one that card was completely destroying everybody. I think Handlock was a great choice to play. Handlock mm -hmm. was really powerful, and uh, when Paladins become better, I think Handlock also uh, becomes better because it usually absolutely crushes Paladins with Hellfires, Shadow Flames, and uh, many many of the killing choices. I think we do beat beat uh, Paladin, so I think it's uh, this is a deck that can be much more popular after the nerfs not popular but better i guess i don't think people will actually play this because we just don't have enough support right now to uh, actually win win games and have in general favorable matchups we just 
Like this deck is good, but not not great, and not great decks don't usually be isn't usually played in Hearthstone. I see. One last question about the deck. Let's say you have Twilight Drake and Mountain Giant in the hand on turn four. Which one do you play in, and why? And like, what what type of situations is there really a difference in deciding which one to play? Mm, I guess versus Warrior, uh, you want to play the Drakes first because they usually have at least one removal, but they might not have two removal, and having the Giant is always better. Okay. Um, Versus, I think, like Shaman, or if you really suspect that your opponent will have a silence, you might want to play the Giant, uh, considering that is important in my opinion. And also versus Priest, uh, Drakes are quite good, like, at least historically always has been, because they don't have the 4 mana removal. Uh, playing Drakes and maybe facelessing it can be uh, powerful versus Priests, but you know, this is, they are not, Priest is not being played right now a lot. Yeah. And, could be not so important, but yeah, yeah. Considering silences and if they have, if your opponent has removal, these are the two tips. Man, I'm so excited to play this deck. I really like, like I said, I really like Plot Twist. I think it's, it's a cool card that I'm, maybe is a little difficult to pilot, but I think with this build, it's so straightforward, right? You want to just drop your four, five, six mana threats, and then you know spend the rest of the turns finding the removal to keep the board clear. Or, you know, mitigate whatever incoming damage is. So I'm super excited to to mess around with this. Um, yeah. What is your favorite archetype in Hearthstone ever? Oh, uh, I except for that mage I mentioned that was you no know, about Echo of Medivh. I absolutely loved that deck. Uh, you know, it was it had the basic idea of having molten giants in your hand, anti kill bots, and Echo of Medivh. Yeah. And uh, playing after you get low, you just do this Frost Nova the opponent and play these giants and win the next turn. I absolutely love that. And absolutely nobody expected that, you know. Everybody thought I was playing a freeze mage because I wasn't playing so many things. You know, I had secrets, card draws. <laughs> I love that deck list. But since it was a bit of a short term list, right after that, Echo of Medivh went away mm -hmm. uh, after a few months. My favorite deck list, I would say, is Midrange Shaman. Midrange Shaman. Yes, uh, it's also go like long gone from the meta game. Uh, sometimes I like look back and cry over it, but uh, I loved the uh, like the story. Mana is, but I'm forgetting card names. Which one? <laughs> uh, Flame Tank, Flame Tank. Oh yeah. Uh, Flame Tank Totem, and in general, like playing these uh, board centric decks, which you know is about trading. Mm -hmm. Uh, have, Alakir is also a card I absolutely love. When this deck was viable, especially like around Nax time, Nax Jarmas time, you know, GVG, it was this. This deck was one of the best decks to play. Uh, it actually had like good matchups, and every pro was bringing it to the tournaments. Uh, you know, the World Championship. I think uh, many people had some type of some type of Alexis that reminded Midrange Shaman, which is, I think, uh, like. The only weakness it had was it had no no real healing effects. Other than that, I love this deck. That had Zapomatic too. I think that wasn't a card back then. Was it not? But Zapomatic. The Wind Fury one. It's like three two Wind Fury. It's a mech. Oh, uh, right, right, right. It was after GVG. This was like what time? To, this was before GVG. If ah. I remember correctly, like when the Undertakers. You play Undertaker. Oh you play my Nerdy gosh! Knights. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, okay, okay. Zombie yeah. Chows. Oh, yeah. yeah, that that's uh, dark times of our stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. We're, I'm trying to I'm trying to get that out of my memory, man. You know, I'm trying, <laughs> trying to like put it, hide it away somewhere. You know, because oh gosh, Undertaker. Holy cow! And remember when Undertaker was, yeah, like how crazy yeah. that card was. Jeez. That's a man. What is your favorite card in Hearthstone? Like in all the years of Hearthstone, what what is your favorite card? Oh, this is, I never thought of this. Uh, let me think. I like Savannah Jaime. I absolutely. <laughs> you so like to play you double play that legends, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite thing in our stuff. Uh, playing have coin Savannah on five and, and another six. Savannah on six. <laughs> yeah. <those> like, <laughs> which is, I think, one of the things that you can do right now versus uh, like these decks that are uh, when you're playing the Zuljin Hunter, you can play one Savannah Jaime and then. Uh, played the four, four mana card to like put three more in your deck. 
I think uh, it, it definitely is really good versus Warrior because Warriors right now may win, that may like make you run out of threats right now, and then fatigue you with the Elysiana. Yeah. Man, so I think this is something that you might take in just as a one-off in your Hunter deck. That was what, what I thought today. Cool, cool. This, is, I, this, this could be a good addition as well, yeah. Have you uh, have you tried any of the solo adventure that just came up? Honestly, I haven't had the time. I just I, I really want to do it though. I I love Hearthstone's adventure uh, parts. It's like having this one one uh, single player content is good. But uh, since I haven't been playing a lot lately, I just hadn't it didn't have the time. I wanted to play more constructed. Uh, man, when you get the chance, you definitely have to try it out. Like, you know, to be fair, I really like the solo content. Like, I like the ladder. It's fun, too. I like to play. Um, but the solo content's cool because it's, like, new cards and new different treasures and different, like, you know, archetypes that you can build. And this one is really, really in-depth. Like, there are, like, so many legs of it. And, you know, each class... You can, you know, you can beat these legs with each class. So, you know, you got nine different vari variables for every match. And then you also have decks within each of those nine classes. So each class has three decks. And then they have a fourth random deck. And then, of course, you build on each of those decks as you play the, the, the solo adventure. It's pretty awesome. And I th it's really, really crazy. It's pretty fun. Um, you know, and it always saves your progress. So it's something that you can just pick up and mess around for five minutes like while you're in between things. And if you're headed out to do something else, you can just come back, pick it up at a later date. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool though. Definitely should check it out. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I like. I loved. I think the last one I played was Karazam with uh, the tower thing. I uh, love that. I think it was the storyline was great too. Yeah. And I'll definitely have to check out the other ones. You got to. This. I. I'm really. I'm really impressed with like the most recent adventures. Like this is this adventure is a kind of a mix of the last two adventures kind of together, and uh, I think it's uh, it makes for a super fun solo experience. I'm actually really surprised. It's a it's quite a, a big amount of content behind a $20 investment or whatever it is for the, the adventure. Nick, on that point, um, anything else you want to let uh, the listeners at home know? Like maybe how they can contact you or follow you on any social media if you're open to giving any of that out? Or anything you want to just I tell guess, people at home about Hearthstone? I guess like one of the things that I realized this week, like when coming, when coming back to the game, I was watching the Grandmasters this week. Um, uh, done this, uh, I, I, Parta, Parsa, this uh, New Zealand girl, she was playing, and the chat was absolutely so sexist and toxic that, mm. like, if if that that's, that can't be a part of our stone, this can't be a, like what, what our community is about. And I, I felt so disgusted by that. And, like, I don't know, I just, I just wanted to say that. And, uh, you know, it's just. I'm glad you brought it up, you know, because, you know, honestly, like uh, the Grandmaster thing in general, it already has so much negative connotation around it just because of the way they picked the 48 people for it and how it's kind of retroactively, uh, you know, applied. And, you know, those people who didn't make it, they really had no like, you know, no one knows how to get into the 48 until after the fact. And I think that's that puts every person who made the 48 under a really critical microscope you know and unfortunately for patra right that's her name patra she's so beautiful yeah. by the way you know she's so pretty but uh and she's a good hearthstone player dude she's she's good and then you know i i just feel like it's it's disappointing that people in chat would have to stoop so low as to you know use the outcomes of the matches as confirmation bias to her Definitely not belonging. Have. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, see this girl, she's not good. Like, why did we pick her? Like, you know, she didn't deserve this spot. But, you know, I those were hard games to be in. Like, and you know, hey, Hearthstone there's only there's one thing you can guarantee in any game of Hearthstone and that's somebody's going to lose, you know? And like this yeah. it doesn't matter how good you are, you know, or whatnot. Like, you know, someone will lose and, you know, unfortunately it was her in those games, but I mean, man, you're definitely right. The, the community has to be better. But that's, you know, that's a t uh, chat moderation kind of thing, too, because, uh, you know, that happens yeah. in a lot of games, right? And it's just, you know, Hearthstone, I, I really feel like the direction of Hearthstone as an eSport 
you know, who knows where it's going to go. Like, this might even be the last year of any kind of competitive Hearthstone. We don't know. You know, I, I think the Grandmasters format is horrible. I think the way they picked it was horrible. I, I think the focus uh, is, is bad, like just trying to put it on these 48 players. Um, it does a disservice for all the other great players out there. Uh, Asmodai, many other people who didn't make it, like who, who def definitely deserve that kind of exposure or the opportunity to get into it. And they shouldn't have to devote 16 hours on a weekend to try to qualify for an open cut to try to make it into there, to fight for one of two spots at the end of the year? No way. I think that's ridiculous. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I love personal though, and I love the community. And even if it didn't really have that competitive esports edge, I would still play the game because it's super fun, you know? Yeah, the so, game is, like, as I said, the main point is about having fun this game. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I really enjoy Hearthstone, and you know, I hope, and I have a lot of money invested in Hearthstone, man. Like, I have all the cards, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm already thinking, like, right now, like, man, I want all my all the fun decks, I want them all gold, you know, but <laughs> like, yeah. you know, I, I, I hate to see the day when it's just like, hey guys, you know what, we've been talking about it over here at Blizzard and Activision, and we decided, you know, we're done with this kids game, we're done with Hearthstone, we're gonna work <laughs> on, you know, something else, right, so... Yeah, you know, yeah. crossing my fingers. But I do understand them from a business perspective. <coughs> I think this Grandmaster format has a merit because when I was watching like last last year's World Championship, even though I'm I like I am invest I am at playing at a high legend level and I see all these players. I mean, when I watch some of the older players that I know their faces of, you know, more the popular streamers, maybe I have this emotional connection with them. And when this uh, when the, when the Hearthstone Championship has all these like from 48 players if 30 of them i have absolutely no idea about who they are mm -hmm. uh, i would not be so invested in watching and maybe like getting into the game so i understand them that uh, you know the best more popular players getting the grandmaster status in a way where you know, more weavers will come i understand them but this is not like competitive i don't know if it's not competitive in a way it's no, just I... you know drawing viewers yeah i feel i feel you yeah, definitely definitely Nick, my man, thank you for doing the podcast with me. I really appreciate it, man. I hope to see you more on the ladder. Um, any last... You, thank you. you anything pleasure. else you want to yeah, say, man? I, 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 let me give my Discord link, maybe, because I don't usually yeah. use uh, other social medias. Uh, my is, my, uh, maybe you can put it in the description. It's sure. Nick, Nick Tiret, uh hashtag uh, 2545. Got it. I'll add it to the YouTube and the the uh okay. podcast okay. Uh, so info. if anybody tries out the handlock list feel free to contact me and maybe have some if, if people want to practice versus this deck i can uh, we can uh, do that as well uh, i love this, this deck list and lots of opportunity to uh, play test versus other players i'm gonna mess with it man i I'm, I'm gonna spend my next week of like standard play just playing this deck you know that's what like it's so funny now because you know my my deck list that i have on my uh you know when i open up the hearthstone client all the deck lists are just decks, the deck lists that people on the podcast have recommended to play. And those are the only lists I play right now, right? And, uh, you know, some of them, like, have kind of fallen out of favor. Like, someone gave me a Temple Rogue list that, uh, you know, obviously with the nerfs just isn't as strong yeah. as anymore. But, um, you know, it's still it's still fun to see, and it's still it's still cool to see. Like, you know, you brought this Handlock. This other guy's name is so legit. He brought a Freeze Mage. Um, and those are both decks that you never see, right? So whenever people see me playing yeah. mage, they're like, oh, it's this fucking conjuring mage. But, you know, then they get hit by Alex Straza into, you know, whatever. <laughs> I have whatever, to check so. that out. I love freeze mage. Oh, definitely. That that one is a fun list, too. And then yeah, uh, he had a bunch of good uh, tech choices to, to fix things. Because at the, at the time, the list that he gave, that was like targeting rogue, solely targeting rogue. But in the podcast, he made mention to like ways to change the list if you wanted to focus against Hunter or against Conjuring Mage. So, um, yeah, definitely cool, man. But Nick, thank you for having, uh, for jumping onto the stream and the podcast. And those of you at home, you remember so you can, thank you. you can follow Nick on his Discord. Try out this handlock uh, list in the description. Let us know what you think, and you know, comment and let me know who you want to see next on the podcast. Uh, this season we still have four or five more episodes lined up we actually got a couple more guests we have kriya and asmodeus kriya is a very popular rogue player um and asmodeus is uh one of my favorite priest players actually he's a combo priest player uh and for those of you who like combo decks he would be a great um 
great one to listen to in the future. So stay tuned to those in the coming weeks. Anyway, we will see you guys next time. Thank you for listening.